Welcome once again to this uh, Bible Hour One, and today uh, we're going to read the entire book of Romans. Uh, so that'll take us pretty much the full hour. I might have just a couple of minor comments after that. Uh, at some point, I'd like to do a much more thorough job on the book of Romans, a much more thorough study, but that would take me two, maybe three, four different sessions because there's just so much to cover. So, but I will have just a few things to say a little bit later. I decided what to do is uh, I'm going to, to uh, so that way we can all be on the same page, literally. I'm going to uh, make available the, the kingdom uh, translation, the uh, New Testament translation that I'm using today, which is, of course, the uh, translation that is that is done by uh, N.T. Wright. So give me a moment. I'm going to bring that up. And we're going to read the book of Romans. And there we go. And Yahweh bless the reading of his word. The letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 1. Paul a slave of King Yahshua, called to be an apostle, set apart for Yahweh's good news, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the sacred writings. The good news about his son, who was descended from David's seed in terms of flesh, and who was marked out powerfully as Yahweh's son in terms of the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, Yahshua, the king, our sovereign. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about believing obedience among all the nations for the sake of his name. That includes you too, who are called by Yahshua the King. This letter comes to all in Rome who love Elohim, all who are called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from Yahweh our Father and King Yahshua the Sovereign. Let me say first that I thank my Elohim for all of you through Yahshua the King, because all the world has heard the news of your faith. Yahweh is my witness, the Elohim I worship in my spirit, in the good news of his son, that I never stop remembering you in my prayers. I ask Yahweh again and again that somehow, at last, I may now be able, in his good purposes, to come to you. I'm longing to see you. I want to share with you some spiritual blessing to give you strength. That is, I want to encourage you and be encouraged by you in the faith you and I share. I don't want you to be unaware, my dear family, that I've often made plans to come to you. It's just that up to now, something has always gotten in the way. I want to bear some fruit among you, as I have been doing among the other nations. I am under obligation to barbarians, as well as to Greeks, you see, both to the wise and to the foolish. That's why I'm eager to announce the good news to you, too, in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the good news. It's Yahweh's power bringing salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also equally to the Greek. This is because Yahweh's covenant justice is unveiled in it from faithfulness to faithfulness. As it says in the scriptures, the just shall live by faith. For the anger of Yahweh is unveiled from heaven against all the wickedness and injustice performed by people who will use injustice to suppress the truth. What can be known of Elohim, you see, is plain to them, since Elohim has made it plain to them. There are, of course, things about Elohim which you can't see, namely his eternal power uh, and um, his, uh, his sovereignty. But ever since the world was created, they have been known and seen in the things that he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. They knew Elohim, but didn't honor him as Elohim or thank him. Instead, they learned to think in useless ways, and their unwise heart grew dark. They declared themselves to be wise, but in fact they became foolish. They swapped the glory of the immortal Elohim for the likeness of the image of mortal humans and of birds, animals, and reptiles. So Elohim gave them up to uncleanness in the desires of their hearts, with the result that they dishonored their bodies among themselves. They swapped Elohim's truth for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Elohim gave them up to shameful desires. Even the women, you see, swapped natural sexual practice for unnatural. And the men, too, abandoned natural sexual relations with women and were inflamed with their lust for one another. Men performed shameless acts with men and received in themselves the appropriate repayment for their mistaken ways. Moreover, just as they did not see fit to hold on to knowledge of Elohim, 
Elohim gave them up to an unfit mind so that they would behave inappropriately. They were filled with all kinds of injustice, wickedness, greed, and evil. They were full of envy, murder, enmity, deceit, and cunning. They became gossips, slanderers, Elohim haters, arrogant, self-important, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, unwise, unfaithful, unfeeling, uncaring. They know that Yahweh has rightly decreed that people who do things like that deserve death. But not only do they do them, they give their approval to people who practice them. Chapter 2. So you have no excuse, anyone, whoever you are, who sit in judgment. When you judge someone else, you condemn yourself. Because you, who are behaving as a judge, are doing the same things. Yahweh's judgment falls, we know, in accordance with the truth on those who do such things. But if you judge those who do them and yet do them yourself, do you really suppose that you will escape Yahweh's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of, of Yahweh's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Don't you know that Elohim's kindness is meant to bring you to repentance? But by your hard, unrepentant heart, you are building up a store of anger for yourself on the day of anger, the day when Yahweh's just judgment will be unveiled. The Elohim who will repay everyone according to their works. When people patiently do what is good and so pursue the quest for glory and honor and immortality, Elohim will give them the life of the age to come. But when people act out of selfish desire and do not obey the truth, but instead obey injustice, there will be anger and fury. There will be trouble and distress for every single person who does what is wicked the Jew first, and also equally the Greek. And there will be glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, the Jew first, and also equally the Greek. Elohim, you see, shows no partiality. Everyone who sinned outside the law, you see, will be judged outside the law. And those who sin from within the law will be judged by means of the law. After all, it isn't those who hear the law who are in the right before Elohim. It's those who do the law who will be declared to be in the right. This is how it works out. Gentiles don't possess the law as their birthright, but whenever they do what the law says, they are a law for themselves despite not possessing the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their, on their hearts. Their conscience bears witness as well, and their thoughts will run this way and that, sometimes accusing them and sometimes excusing. On the day when, according to the gospel I proclaim, Elohim judges all human secrets through King Yahshua. But supposing you call yourself a Jew, supposing you rest your hope in the law, supposing you celebrate the fact that Yahweh is your Elohim and that you know what he wants, and that by the law's instruction you can make appropriate moral distinctions, supposing you believe yourself to be a guide to the blind, a light to people in darkness, a teacher of the foolish, an instructor for children, all because in the law you possess the outline of knowledge and truth, well then, if you're going to teach someone else, aren't you going to teach yourself? If you say people shouldn't steal, do you steal? If you say people shouldn't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? If you loathe idols, do you rob temples? If you boast in the law, do you dishonor Yahweh by breaking the law? This is what the scripture says. Because of you, Elohim's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Circumcision, you see, has real value for people who keep the law. If, however, you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Meanwhile, if uncircumcised people keep the law's requirements, their uncircumcision will be regarded as circumcision, won't it? So people who are by nature uncircumcised but who fulfill the law will pass judgment on people like you who possess the letter of the law and circumcision but who break the law. The Jew isn't the person who appears to be one, you see nor circumcision what it appears to be, a matter of physical flesh. <clears throat> the Jew is the one in secret, and circumcision is a matter of the heart and the spirit rather than the letter. Such a person gets praise, not from humans, but from Elohim. Chapter 3. What advantage, then, does the Jew possess? What indeed is the point of circumcision? A great deal in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with Yahweh's oracles. What follows from that? If some of them were unfaithful to their commission, does their unfaithfulness nullify Yahweh's faithfulness? Certainly not. Let Elohim be, Elohim be true and every human being false, as the scripture says, so that you may be found in the right in what you say. 
and may win the victory when you come to court. But if our being in the wrong proves that Yahweh is in the right, what are we going to say? That Elohim is unjust to inflict anger on people? I'm reducing things to a human scale. Certainly not. How then could Yahweh judge the world? But if Yahweh's truthfulness grows all the greater and brings him glory in and through my falsehood, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil so that good may come, as some people blasphemously say about us, and as some allege that we say? People like that at least deserve the judgment they get. What then? Are we in fact better off? No, certainly not. I have already laid down this charge, you see. Jews as well as Greeks are all under the power of sin. This is what the scripture says. No one is in the right, nobody at all. No one understands or goes looking for Elohim. All of them alike have wandered astray. Together, they have all become futile. None of them behaves kindly. No, not one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are quick when there's blood to be shed. Disaster and wretchedness are in their paths. And they did not know the way of peace. They have no fear of Elohim before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it is speaking to those who are in the law. The purpose of this is that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be brought to the bar of Yahweh's judgment. No mere mortal, you see, can be declared to be in the right before Elohim on the basis of the works of the law. What you get through the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, quite apart from the law, though the law and the prophets bore witness to it, Yahweh's covenant justice has been displayed. Yahweh's covenant justice comes into operation through the faithfulness of Yahshua the Messiah for the benefit of all who have faith. For there is no distinction. All sinned and fell short of Yahweh's glory. And by Yahweh's grace, they are freely declared to be in the right, to be members of the covenant through the redemption which is found in the Messiah, Yahshua. Elohim put Yahshua forth as the place of mercy through faithfulness by means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his covenant justice because of the passing over in eternal forbearance of sins committed beforehand. This was to demonstrate his covenant justice in the present time. That is, that he himself is in the right and that he declares to be in the right everyone who trusts in the faithfulness of Yahshua. So what happens to boasting? It is ruled out. Through what sort of law? The law of works? No, through the law of faith. We calculate, you see, that a person is declared to be in the right on the basis of faith, apart from works of the law. Or does Yahweh only belong to Jews? Doesn't he belong to the nations as well? Yes, of course, to the nations as well, since Yahweh is one. He will make the declaration in the right over the uncircumcised on the basis of faith and over the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then abolish the law through faith? Certainly not. Rather, we establish the law. Chapter 4. What shall we say then? Have we found Abraham to be our ancestor in a human fleshly sense? After all, if Abraham was reckoned in the right on the basis of works, he has grounds to boast, but not in Yahweh's presence. So what does the, the, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed Elohim, and it was calculated in his favor, putting him in the right. Now when someone works, the reward they get is not calculated on the basis of generosity, but on the basis of what they are owed. But if someone doesn't work, but simply believes in the one who declared the wicked to be in the right, that person's faith is calculated in their favor, putting them in the right. We see the same thing when David speaks of the blessing that comes to someone whom Yahweh calculates to be in the right, apart from works. Blessed are those whose law-breaking is forgiven and whose sins have been covered over. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will not calculate sin. So then... Does this blessing come on, uncircum come on circumcised people or on uncircumcised? This is the passage we quoted. His faith was calculated to Abraham as indicating that he was in the right. How was it calculated? When he was circumcised or when he was uncircumcised? It wasn't when he was circumcised. It was when he was uncircumcised. He received circumcision as a sign and seal of the status of covenant membership on the basis of faith, which he had when he was still uncircumcised. This was so that he could be the father of all who believe, even when uncircumcised. So that the status of covenant membership can be calculated to their account as well. He is also, of course, the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who follow the steps of the faith which Abraham possessed 
while still uncircumcised. The promise, you see, didn't come to Abraham or to his family through the law. The promise, that is, that he would inherit the world. It came through the covenant justice of faith. For if those who belong to the law are going to inherit, then faith is empty, and the promise has been abolished. For the law stirs up Yahweh's anger, but where there is no law, there is no law breaking. That's why it's by faith, so that it can be in accordance with grace, and so that the promise can thereby be validated for the entire family, not simply those who are from the law, but those who share the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Just as the scripture says, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened in the presence of the Elohim in whom he believed, the Elohim who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Against all hope, but still in hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations in line with what had been said to him. That's what your family will be like. He didn't become weak in faith as he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and the lifelessness of Sarah's womb. He didn't waver in unbelief when faced with Yahweh's promise. Instead, he grew strong in faith and gave glory to Yahweh, being fully convinced that Elohim had the power to accomplish what he had promised. That is why it was calculated to him in terms of covenant justice. But it wasn't written for him alone that it was calculated to him. It was written for us as well. It will be calculated to us too, since we believe in the one who raised from the dead, Yahshua, our sovereign, who was handed over because of our trespasses and raised because of our justification. Chapter 5. The result is this. Since we have been declared in the right on the basis of faith, we have peace with Elohim through our sovereign Yahshua the Messiah. Through him, we have been allowed to approach by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we celebrate the hope of the glory of Yahweh. That's not all. We also celebrate in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces patience. Patience produces a well-formed character, and a character like that produces hope. Hope, in its turn, does not make us ashamed, because the love of Yahweh has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is all based on what the Messiah did. While we were still weak, at that very moment he died on behalf of the unrighteous, the wicked. It's a rare thing to find someone who will die on behalf of an upright person though I suppose someone might be brave enough to die for a good person. But this is how Yahweh demonstrates his own love for us. The Messiah died for us while we were still sinners. How much more in that case, since we have been declared to be in the right by his blood, are we going to be saved by him from Yahweh's coming anger? When we were enemies, you see, we were reconciled to Yahweh through the death of his son. If that's so, how much more, having already been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? And that's not all. We even celebrate in Yahweh through our sovereign Yahshua, the Messiah, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one human being and death through sin, and in that way, death spread to all humans in that all sinned. Sin was in the world, you see, even in the absence of the law, though sin is not calculated when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over the people who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam had done, Adam, who was the imprint of the one who would come. But it isn't as the trespass, so also the gift, for if many died by one person's trespass, how much more has Yahweh's grace and the gift and grace to the one person, Yahshua the Messiah, abounded to the many? And nor is, or, and nor is it as through the sin of this one, so also the gift. For the judgment which followed the one trespass resulted in a negative verdict. But the free gift which followed many trespasses resulted in a positive verdict. For if by the trespass of the one, death reigned through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of covenant membership of being in the right reign in life through the one man, Yahshua the Messiah? So then, just as through the trespass of one person, the result was condemnation for all people, even so, to the upright act of one person, the result is justification, life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one person, many receive the status of sinner, so through the obedience of one person will receive the status of in the right. 
the law came in alongside so that the trespass might be might be filled out to its full extent but where sin increased grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death even so through yahweh's faithful covenant justice grace might reign to the life of the age to come through yahshua the master the messiah our sovereign chapter 6 what are we to say then shall we continue in the state of sin so that grace may increase certainly not we died to sin how can we still live in it don't you know that all of us who were baptized into the messiah yahshua were baptized into his death that means that we were buried with him through baptism into death so that just as the messiah was raised from the dead through the father's glory we too might behave with a new quality of life for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection this is what we know our old humanity was crucified with the messiah so that the bodily solidarity of sin might be abolished and that we should no longer be enslaved to sin a person who has died you see has been declared free from all charges of sin but if we died with the messiah we believe that we shall live with him we know that the messiah having been raised from the dead will never die again death no longer has any authority over him the death he died you see he died to sin once and only once but the life he lives he lives to yahweh in the same way you too must calculate yourselves as being dead to sin and alive to Yahweh in the Messiah, Yahshua. So don't allow sin to rule in your mortal body to make you obey its desires. Nor should you present your limbs and organs to sin to be used for its wicked purposes. Rather, present yourselves to Yahweh as people alive from the dead and your limbs and organs to Yahweh to be used for the righteous purposes of his covenant. Sin won't actually rule over you, you see, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Don't you know that if you present yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you really are slaves of the one you obey, whether that happens to be sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to final vindication. Thank Yahweh that though you once were slaves to sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the pattern of teaching to which you were committed. You were freed from sin, and now you have been enslaved to Yahweh's covenant justice. I'm using a human picture because of your natural human weakness. For just as you presented your limbs and organs as slaves to uncleanness and to one degree of lawlessness after another, so now present your limbs and organs as slaves to covenant justice, which leads to holiness. When you were slaves of sin, you see, you were free with respect to covenant justice. What fruit did you ever have from the things of which you are now ashamed? Their destination is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and enslaved to Yahweh, you have fruit for holiness. Its destination is the life of the age to come. The wages paid by sin, you see, are death. But Yahweh's free gift is the life of the age to come in the Messiah, Yahshua, our sovereign. Chapter 7. Surely you know, my dear family, I am, after all, talking to people who know the law, that the law rules a person as long as that person is alive. The law binds a married woman to her husband during his lifetime. But if he dies, she is free from the law as regards her husband. So then she will be called an adulteress if she goes with another man while her husband is alive. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress if she goes with another man. In the same way, my dear family, you too died to the law, to the body of the Messiah, so that you could belong to someone else, to the one who was raised from the dead, in fact so that we could bear fruit for Elohim. For when we were living a mortal human life, the passions of sins which were through the law were at work in our limbs and organs, causing us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been cut loose from the law. We have died to the thing in which we were held tightly. The aim is that we should now be enslaved in the new life of the spirit, not in the old life of the letter. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? Certainly not. But I would not have known sin except through the law. I would not have known covetousness if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin grabbed its opportunity through the commandment and produced all kinds of covetousness within me. Apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. The commandment which pointed to life turned out in my case to bring death. For sin grabbed its opportunity through the commandment. It deceived me and, th and through it killed me. 
So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, upright and good. Was it that good thing then that brought death to me? Certainly not. On the contrary, it was sin in order that it might appear a sin, working through the good thing and producing death in me. This was in order that sin might become very sinful indeed through the commandment. We know, you see, that the law is spiritual. I, however, am made of flesh, sold as a slave under sin's authority. I don't understand what I do. I don't do what I want, you see, but I do what I hate. So if I do what I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is good. But now it is no longer I that do it, it's sin living within me. I know you see that, that no good thing lives in me that is in my human flesh. <clears throat> For I can will the good, but I can't perform it. For I don't do the good thing I want to do, but I end up doing the evil thing I don't want to do. So if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I doing it, it's sin living inside me. This then is what I find about the law. When I want to do what is right, evil lies closely at hand. I delight in Yahweh's law, you see, according to my inmost self. But I see another law in my limbs and organs, fighting a battle against the law of my mind and taking me as a prisoner in the law of sin, which is in my limbs and organs. What a miserable person I am. Who is going to rescue me from the body of this death? Thank Yahweh, through Yashua, our sovereign and king. So then left to my own self, I am enslaved to Yahweh's law with my mind, but to sin's law with my human flesh. Chapter 8. So therefore, there is no condemnation for those in the Messiah Yahshua. Why not? Because the law of the spirit of life in the Messiah Yahshua released you from the law of sin and death. For Yahweh has done what the law, being weak because of human flesh, was incapable of doing. Yahweh has sent his own, Yahweh we sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, and right there in the flesh he condemned sin. This was in order that the right and proper verdict of the law could be fulfilled in us, as we live not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Look at it like this. People whose lives are determined by human flesh focus their minds on matters to do with the flesh. But people whose lives are determined by the spirit focus their minds on matters to do with the spirit. Focus the mind on the flesh and you'll die, but focus it on the spirit and you'll have life and peace. The mind focused on the flesh, you see, is hostile to Elohim. It doesn't submit to Yahweh's law. In fact, it can't. Those who are determined by the flesh can't please Elohim. But you're not people of the flesh. You're people of the spirit, if indeed Yahweh's spirit lives within you. Note that anyone who doesn't have the spirit of the Messiah doesn't belong to him. But if the Messiah is in, in you, the body is indeed dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of covenant justice. So then, if the spirit of the one who raised Yahshua from the dead lives within you, the one who raised the Messiah from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, too, through his spirit who lives within you. So then, my dear family, we are in debt, but not to human flesh, to live our life in that way. If you live in accordance with the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All who are led by the Spirit of Yahweh, you see, are Yahweh's children. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery, did you? To go back again into a state of fear. But you received the spirit of sonship, in whom we call out Abba, Father. When that happens, it is the Spirit itself giving supporting witness to what our own spirit is saying, that we are Yahweh's children. And if we're children... We are also heirs, heirs of Yahweh, and fellow heirs with the Messiah, as long as we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is how I work it out. The sufferings we go through in the present time are not worth put in, putting in the scale alongside the glory that is going to be unveiled for us. Yes, creation itself is on tiptoe with expectation, eagerly awaiting the moment when Yahweh's children will be revealed. Creation, you see, was subjected to pointless futility, not of its own volition, but because of the one who placed it in this subjection in the hope that creation itself would be freed from its slavery to decay to enjoy the freedom that comes when Yahweh's children are glorified. Let me explain. We know that the entire creation is groaning together and going through labor pains together up until the present time. Not only so, we too, who we who have the first fruits of the Spirit's life within us are groaning within ourselves as we eagerly await our adoption the redemption of our body. We were saved, you see, in hope. But hope isn't hope if you can see it. Who hopes for what they can see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it eagerly, but also patiently. 
In the same way, too, the Spirit comes alongside and helps us in our weakness. We don't know what to pray for as we ought to, but that same Spirit pleads on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. And the searcher of hearts knows what the Spirit is thinking because the Spirit pleads for Yahweh's people according to Yahweh's will. We know, in fact, that Yahweh works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Those he foreknew, you see, he also marked out in advance to be shaped according to the model of the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn of a large family. And those he marked out in advance, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to all this? If Yahweh is for us, who is against us? Yahweh, after all, did not spare his own son. He gave him up for us all. How then will he not with him freely give all things to us? Who will bring a charge against Yahweh's chosen ones? It is Yahweh who declares them in the right. Who is going to condemn? It is the Messiah, Yahshua, who has died, or rather has been raised, who is at Yahweh's right hand, and who also prays on our behalf. Who shall separate us from the Messiah's love? Suffering, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as the scripture says, because of you we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep destined for slaughter. No, in all these things we are completely victorious to the one who loved us. I'm persuaded you see that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of Yahweh and King Yahshua, our sovereign. Chapter 9. I'm speaking the truth in the Messiah. I'm not lying. I call my conscience as witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and endless pain in my heart. Left to my own self, I'm half inclined to pray that I could be a curse, cut off from the Messiah on behalf of my own family, my own flesh and blood relatives. They are Israelites. The sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises all belong to them. The patriarchs are their ancestors. And it is from them, according to the flesh, that the Messiah has come, who is Elohim over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it can't be the case that Yahweh's word has failed. Not all who are from Israel, you see, are in fact Israel. Nor is it the case that all the children count the seed of Abraham. No, in Isaac shall your seed be named. That means that it isn't the flesh and blood children who are Yahweh's children. Rather, it is the children of the promise who will be calculated as seed. This is what the promise said, you see. Around this time I shall return, and Sarah shall have a son. And that's not all. The same thing happened when Rebekah conceived children by one man, our ancestor Isaac. When they had not yet been born and had done nothing, either good or bad, so that what Elohim had in mind in making his choice might come to pass, not because of works, but because of the one who calls. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. As the scripture says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. So what are we going to say? Is Elohim unjust? Certainly not. He says to Moses, you see, I will have mercy on those on whom I will have mercy, and I will pity those I will pity. So then, it doesn't depend on human willing or on human effort. It depends on Yahweh who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, this is why I have raised you up, to show my power in you, and so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on the one he wants, and he hardens the one he wants. You'll say to me then, so why does he still blame people? Who can stand against his purpose? Are you a mere human being going to answer Elohim back? Surely the clay won't say to the potter, why did you make me like this? Doesn't the potter have authority over the clay so that he can make from the same lump one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Supposing Yahweh wanted to demonstrate his anger and make known his power, and for that reason put up very patiently with the vessels of anger created for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, the ones he prepared in advance for glory, including us, whom he called not only from among the Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. This is what he says in Hosea. I will call not my people, my people, and not beloved, I will call beloved. And the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living Elohim. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, even if the number of Israel's sons are like the sand by the sea, only a remnant shall be saved. For Yahweh will bring judgment on the earth, complete and decisive. And Isaiah said in an earlier passage, if Yahweh of hosts had not left a seed, we would have become like Sodom and been made like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the nations who are not aspiring toward covenant membership 
have it, have obtained covenant membership, but it is a covenant membership based on faith. Excuse me. What then shall we say that the nations who were not aspiring toward covenant membership have obtained covenant membership, but it is a covenant membership based on faith. Israel, meanwhile, though eager for the law which defined the covenant, did not attain to the law. Why not? Because they did not pursue it on the basis of faith, but as though it was on the basis of works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As the scripture says, look, I'm placing in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will trip people up. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Chapter 10. My dear family, the longing of my heart and my prayer to Elohim on their behalf is for their salvation. I can testify on their behalf that they have a zeal for Yahweh, but it is not based on knowledge. They were ignorant, you see, of Yahweh's covenant faithfulness, and they were trying to establish a covenant status of their own, so they didn't submit to Yahweh's faithfulness. The Messiah, you see, is the goal of the law, so that covenant membership may be available for all who believe. Moses writes, you see, about the covenant membership defined by the law, that the person who performs the law's command shall live in them. But the faith-based covenant membership puts it like this. Don't say in your heart, who shall go up to heaven? In other words, to bring the Messiah down. Or who shall go down into the depths? In other words, to bring the Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we proclaim. Because if you profess with your mouth that Yahshua is sovereign and believe in your heart that Yahweh raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why? Because the way to covenant membership is by believing with the heart and the way to salvation is by professing with the mouth. The scripture says, you see, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek since the same sovereign is sovereign of all and is rich toward all who call upon him. All who call upon the name of Yahweh, you see, will be saved. So how are they to call on someone when they haven't believed in him? And how are they to believe if they don't hear? And how will they hear except, excuse me, how will they hear without someone announcing it to them? And how will people make that announcement unless they are sent? As the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the ones who bring good news of good tidings. But not all obey the good news. Isaiah asks, you see, Master, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing comes from the word of, of the Messiah. This might make us ask, did they not hear? But they certainly did. Their sound went out into all the world, and their words to the ends of the earth. But I ask, did Israel not know? To begin with, Moses says, I will make you jealous with a non-nation, and stir you to anger with a foolish people. Then Isaiah, greatly daring, puts it like this. I was found by those who were not looking for me. I became visible to those who were not asking for me. But in respect of Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disbelieving and disagreeable people. Chapter 11. So I ask, <clears throat> has Yahweh abandoned his people? Certainly not. I myself am an Israelite from the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. Elohim has not abandoned his people, the ones he chose in advance. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? describing how he pleads with Elohim against Israel. Master, he says, they have killed your prophets. They've thrown down your altars. I'm the only one left. They're trying to kill me. But what is the reply from the eternal word? I have left for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, at the present time, there is, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer by works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Did Israel not obtain what it was looking for? Well, the chosen ones obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as the Bible says. Yahweh gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that wouldn't see and ears that wouldn't hear, right down to this present day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a punishment for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see and make their backs bend low forever. So I asked them, have they tripped up in such a way as to fall completely? Certainly not. Rather, by their trespass, salvation has come to the nations in order to make them jealous. If their trespass means riches for the world and their impoverishment means riches for the nations, how much more will their fullness mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Insofar as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I celebrate my particular ministry so that if possible, I can make my flesh jealous and have some of them. If their casting away, you see, means reconciliation for the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? 
Take another illustration. If the first fruits are holy, so is the whole lump. And another, if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and came to share in the root of the olive with its rich sap, don't boast over the branches. If they do boast, remember this. It isn't you that supports the root, but the root that supports you. I know what you'll say next. Branches are broken off so that I could be grafted in. That's all very well. They were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand firm by faith. Don't get big ideas about it. Instead, be afraid. After all, if Elohim didn't spare the natural branches, there's a strong possibility he won't spare you. Note carefully then that Yahweh is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who have fallen, but he's kind to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And they too, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted back in. Back in. Elohim is able, you see, to graft them back in. For if you are cut out of what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will they, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? My dear brothers and sisters, you mustn't get the wrong idea and think too much of yourselves. That is why I don't want you to remain in ignorance of this mystery. A hardening has come for a time upon Israel. Until the fullness of the nations comes in, and that is how all Israel shall be saved, as the Bible says. The deliverer will come from Zion and will turn away wickedness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them whenever I take away their sins. As regards the good news, their enemies, for your sake, but as regards Yahweh's choice, <clears throat> they are beloved because of the patriarchs. Yahweh's gifts and Yahweh's call, you see, cannot be undone. For just as you were once disobedient to Yahweh, but now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they have now disbelieved as well. In order that, through the mercy which has come your way, they too may now receive mercy. For Elohim has shut up all people in disobedience, so that he may have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of Elohim. We cannot search his judgments. We cannot fathom his ways. For who has known the mind of Yahweh or who has given him counsel? Who has given a gift to him which needs to be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. Glory to him forever. Amen. Chapter 12. So, my dear family, this is my appeal to you by the mercies of Yahweh. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Yahweh. Worship like this brings your mind into line with Yahweh's. What's more, don't let yourselves be squeezed into the shape dictated by the present age. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can work out what Yahweh's will is, what is good, acceptable, and complete. Do the grace which is given to me, I have this to say to each one of you. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. Rather, think soberly, in line with faith, the true standard which Yahweh has marked out for each of you. As in one body, we have many limbs and organs, you see, and all the parts have different functions. So we, many as we are, are one body in the Messiah, and individually, we belong to one another. Well, then, we have gifts that differ in accordance with the grace that has been given to us, and we must use them appropriately. If it is prophecy, we must prophecy according to the pattern of the faith. If it is serving, we must work at our serving. If teaching, at our teaching. If exhortation, at our exhortation. If giving, with generosity. If leading, with energy. If doing acts of kindness, with cheerfulness. Love must be real. Hate what is evil. Stick fast to what is good. Be truly affectionate in showing love for one another. Compete with each other in giving mutual respect. Don't get tired of working hard. Be on fire with the Spirit. Work as slaves for Yahweh. Celebrate your hope. Be patient in suffering. Give constant energy to prayer. Contribute to the needs of Yahweh's people. Make sure you are hospitable to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't curse them. Celebrate with those who are celebrating. Mourn with the mourners. Come to the same mind with one another. Don't give yourself airs, but associate with the humble. Don't get too clever for yourselves. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Think through what will seem good to everyone who is watching. If it's possible, as far as you can, live at peace with all people. Don't take revenge, my dear people, but allow Yahweh's anger room to work. The scripture says, after all, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says Yahweh. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. If you do this, you will pile up burning coals in his head. Don't let evil conquer you, rather conquer evil with good. Chapter 13, 
Every person must be subject to the ruling authorities. There's no authority you see except from Yahweh. And those that exist have been put in place by Yahweh. As a result, anyone who rebels against authority is resisting what Yahweh has set up. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terrorists for people who do good, but only for people who do evil. If you want to have no fear of the ruling power, do what is good, and it will praise you. It is Yahweh's servant you see for you and your good. But if you do evil, be afraid. The sword it carries is no empty gesture. It is Yahweh's servant, you see, an agent of justice to bring his anger on evildoers. That is why it is necessary to submit, not only to avoid punishment, but because of conscience. That too is why you pay taxes. The officials in question are Yahweh's ministers attending to this very thing. So pay each of them what is owed, tribute to those who collect it, revenue to those who collect it, respect those who should be respected, honor the people one ought to honor. Don't owe anybody, uh, don't owe anything to anyone except the debt of mutual love. If you love your neighbor, you see, you will fulfill the law. Commandments like don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to its neighbor, so love is the fulfillment of the law. This is all the more important because you know what time it is. The hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. Our salvation, you see, is nearer now than it was when we first came to the faith. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let's put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's behave appropriately as in the daytime, not in wild parties and drunkenness, not in orgies and shameless immorality, not in bad temper and jealousy. Instead, put on the sovereign Yahshua, the Messiah, and don't make any allowance for the flesh and its lusts. Chapter 14. Welcome someone who is weak in faith, but not in order to have disputes on difficult points. One person believes it's all right to eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. The one who eats should not despise the one who does not. And the one who does not should not condemn the one who does, because Elohim has welcomed them. Who do you think you are to judge someone else's servants? They stand or fall before their own master. And stand they will, because the master can make them stand. One person reckons one day more important than another. Someone else regards all days as equally important. Each person must make up their own mind. <clears throat> the one who celebrates the day does so in honor of Yahweh. The one who eats does so in honor of Yahweh and gives thanks to Elohim. The one who does not eat abstains in honor of Yahweh and gives thanks, and gives thanks to Elohim. None of us lives to ourselves. None of us dies to ourselves. If we live, we live to Yahweh. And if we die, we die to Yahweh. So then... Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Yahweh. That is why the Messiah died and came back to life, so that he might be sovereign both of the dead and of the living. So you then, why do you condemn your fellow believer? Or you, why do you despise a fellow believer? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Elohim, as the scripture says, as I live, says Yahweh, to me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall give praise to Elohim. So then, we must each give an account of ourselves to Elohim. Do not then pass judgment on one another any longer. If you want to exercise your judgment, do so on this question. How to avoid placing obstacles or stumbling blocks in front of a fellow family member. I know, and I'm persuaded in the sovereign Yahshua that nothing is unclean in itself, except that some things do become unclean for the person who regards them as such. For if your brother or sister is being harmed by what you eat, you're no longer behaving in accordance with love. Don't let your food destroy someone for whom the Messiah died. So don't let something that is good for you make other people blaspheme. Yahweh's kingdom, you see, isn't about food and drink, but about justice, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Anyone who serves the Messiah like this pleases Yahweh and deserves respect from other people. So then, let's find and follow the way of peace and discover how to build each other up. Don't pull down Yahweh's work on account of food. Everything is pure, but it becomes evil for anyone who causes offense when they eat. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or anything else which makes your fellow believers stumble. <clears throat> Hold firmly to the faith which you, have, which you have as a matter between yourself and Elohim. When you've thought something through and can go ahead without passing judgment on yourself, Yahweh's blessing on you. But anyone who doubts is condemned even in the act of eating because it doesn't spring from faith. Whatever is not a faith is sin. Chapter 15. We, the strong ones should bear with the frailty of the weak and not please ourselves. Each one of us should please our neighbor for his or her good to build them up. The Messiah you see did not please himself. Instead, as the scripture says, 
the reproaches of those who reproach you are falling on me. Whatever was written ahead of time, you see, was written for us to learn from, so that through patience and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the Elohim of patience and encouragement grant you to come to a common mind among yourselves in accordance with the Messiah, Yahshua, so that with one mind and one mouth, you may glorify the Elohim and Father of our sovereign, Yahshua, the Messiah. Welcome one another, therefore, as the Messiah has welcomed you to Yahweh's glory. Let me tell you why. The Messiah became a servant of the circumcised people in order to demonstrate the truthfulness of Yahweh, that is, to confirm the promises to the patriarchs and to bring the nations to praise Yahweh for his mercy. As the scripture says, this is, that is why I will praise you among the nations and will sing to your name. And again, it says, rejoice you nations with his people. And again, praise Yahweh all nations and let all the people sing his praise. And Isaiah says once more, there shall be the root of Jesse, the one who rises up to rule the nations. The nations shall hope in him. May the Elohim of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When I think of you, my dear family, I myself am thoroughly convinced that you are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and well able to give one another instruction. But I've written to you very boldly at some points, calling things to your mind through the grace which Yahweh has given me, to enable me to be a minister of King Yahshua for the nations, working in the priestly service of Yahweh's good news, so that the offering of the nations may be acceptable, sanctified in the Holy Spirit. This is the glad confidence I have in King Yahshua and in Yahweh's own presence. Far be it from me, you see, to speak about anything except what the Messiah has accomplished through me for the obedience of the nations in word and deed, and the power of signs and wonders, and the power of Yahweh's spirit. I've completed announcing the good news of the Messiah from Jerusalem around as far as Illyricum. My driving ambition has been to announce the good news in places where the Messiah has not been named, so that I can avoid building on anyone else's foundation. Instead, as the scripture says, people who hadn't been told about him will see, people who hadn't heard will understand. That's why I have faced so many obstacles to stop me coming to you. But now, finding myself with no more room in these regions, I have a great longing to come to you now at last after so many years, and so to make my way to Spain. You see, I'm hoping to see you as I pass through and to be sent on my way there by you once I have been refreshed by you for a while. Now, though, I'm going to Jerusalem to render service to Yahweh's people there. Macedonia and Achaia, you see, have happily decided to enter into partnership with the poor believers in Jerusalem. They were eager to do this, and indeed they owe them a debt. If the nations have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, it is right and proper that they should minister to their earthly needs. So when I have completed this and tied up all the loose ends, I will come via you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I shall come with the full blessing of the Messiah. I urge you, my dear family, through our sovereign Yahshua the Messiah, and through the love of the Spirit, fight the battle for me in your prayers to Elohim on my behalf, so that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, and so that my service to Jerusalem may be welcomed gladly by Yahweh's people. If this happens, I will come to you in joy through the will of Yahweh, and be refreshed by being with you. May the Elohim of peace be with you all. Amen. Chapter 16. Let me introduce to you our sister Phoebe. She is a deacon in the assembly at Kenkreya. I want you to welcome her in Yahweh as is proper for one of Yahweh's people. Please give her whatever practical assistance she may need from you. She has been a benefactor to many people, myself included. Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in King Yahshua. They put their lives on the line for me. It isn't only me, but all the Gentile assemblies that owe them a debt of gratitude. Greet the assembly in their house as well. Greet my dear Epinetus. He was the first fruits of the Messiah's harvest in Asia. Greet Miriam, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and fellow prisoners, who are well known among the apostles and who were in the Messiah before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in Yahweh. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in the Messiah, and my dear Stachus. Greet Apelles, who has proved his worth in the Messiah. Greet the people from the Aristobulus household. Greet my relative, Herodian. Greet those in Yahweh who belong to the household of Narcissus. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have worked hard in Yahweh. Greet dear Persis, who has done a great deal of work in Yahweh. Greet Rufus, one of Yahweh's chosen and also his mother, my mother too, in effect. Greet Ansyncritus, Phlegian, Hermes, Petrobas, Hermas, and the family with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, Olympus too, and all Yahweh's people who are with them. 
greet one another with a holy kiss. All the Messiah's assemblies send you greetings. I urge you, my dear family, to watch out for those who cause divisions and problems. Contrary to the teaching you learn, avoid them. People like that are serving their own appetites instead of our sovereign Messiah. They deceive the hearts of simple-minded people with their smooth and flattering speech. Your obedience, you see, is well known to all, and so I'm rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise when it comes to good and innocent when it comes to evil. The Elohim of peace will quickly crush the Satan under your feet. May the grace of our sovereign Yahshua be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends you greetings, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, the scribe for this letter, greet you in Yahweh. Gaius, who is host to me in the whole assembly, sends you greetings. Erastus, the city treasurer, sends you greetings, as does another brother, Cordus. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, the proclamation of Yahshua the Messiah, in accordance with the unveiling of the mystery kept hidden for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings, according to the command of the eternal Elohim, for the obedience of faith among all the nations, to the only wise Elohim, through Yahshua the Messiah, to whom be glory to the coming ages. Amen. And that is the book of Romans. Now, let me just say a couple of things here. So, as I said, I'm not going to go too deeply into this because I'm trying to keep these to just about an hour, but I do want to just say a few things. This is not an easy letter to understand, right? I mean, as, you, as, you, as we're reading through this, I suspect that you, like me, are probably like baffled in certain parts, right? Saying, what in the world is happening right now, right? <laughs> well, you know, there are reasons for that, right? And and I have to confess to you that I'm I'm still better learning this book. I don't I don't have everything straight in my own mind, which is one of the reasons that I'm not going to give you in-depth comments because this is this to me is other than the book of Revelation, this is probably the most difficult Bible book for me to understand. Yes, I understand the you know the 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 skin diseases of Leviticus better than I understand some of the things that are written in this in, the, in this letter. <laughs> so if you if so if you find yourself a little bit mind boggled as you read this, welcome to the club. It's a it's it's a club that's been around for for literally thousands of years, right? Because scholars have debated the meaning of Romans in different chapters for you know for centuries. Okay, so uh, so don't feel badly if 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 it looks a little bit confusing to you, but uh, but I will say this. Everything in there. The reason why so much of it is is is, uh, is is a little bit tough to understand, is because you need to understand the way Paul thinks. And the more that you understand the way Paul thinks, the more comprehensible the book becomes. This was written to the Roman Assembly, quite obviously. Um, just a little bit about Rome and and the, the setting here. Why the reason why this book is so important. Um, this is this is perhaps. I hesitate to use the word, the term, the, the, the most important, but this is one of the most important letters that Paul ever wrote because of, of the, the magnitude of the doctrines that he spreads out through here. It's, it's, a, it's as you can see, it's chock full of what we today refer to as, as doctrine, right? So amongst, you know, amongst the, 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 the Christian churches, Christianity will say that this is like a book that's loaded with doctrine and theology, right? I don't, like to use those terms for a number of reasons, but this some of the major teachings that Paul put out there are found in the book of Romans, encapsulated very well. You know, things that he talks about even in Galatians and other places, he goes through and he 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 kind of encapsulates all these things to the Roman assembly because it was an important assembly. You want to keep in mind that Rome, remember, it's it's hard for me to to describe the magnitude of the Roman Empire. I mean Honestly, in my opinion, as big as the United States is today, not big in size, but as big in prominence in our, in our modern world, um, just bear in mind that the United States is, is a little over 200 years old, okay? Now, when you go look at the history of the Roman Empire, it, it'll boggle your mind. When you go look at the extent of the, of the Roman Empire in history, it'll boggle your mind, right? So... To, to have a letter specifically directed to that assembly in Rome was huge and it was and it was important because there were things and there one of the reasons why it's hard to understand is because there are like I've explained before it's like trying to it's trying like trying to listen to one end of a phone conversation right or if you or if or if I put these headphones on and I start to uh, now now 
Oh, it's going to, because I moved it, it's going to change my speakers. So let me just make sure it doesn't do that. Okay. So if I take those headphones and put them on and I start speaking with someone to have a private conversation, you're going to guess some of the things perhaps that I'm saying with that person, right? If I'm not being careful, but you're never going to fully understand the context and the impact of what I'm speaking of with that person, because you're not hearing the other side of the conversation. It's just not possible. So unless you sit there and like, really, like we do in our day with the letters of Paul and start studying every single piece. And well, what did he say here? What did he say there? And what did he say, you know, unless you do that, there's no way that you're really going to fully understand the impact of that conversation. Right? So you, that's why you get a lot of people, you know, who, who, when they do gossip, they, they, they go, they make things inherently worse for everyone because they don't tell you the full truth, right? They hear something, it's hearsay. They hear something that sounds like something, but it's out of context or they didn't hear the right words. And therefore you create a whole thing about it that when you go and get down to the brass, you know, get to brass tacks and get to the facts, you, you, you simply don't, it's something completely different than what you, you what you imagine, right? So, <clears throat> so it is with, with the writings of Paul, not just Romans, but many others. Galatians is another one that's notorious for that, right? There are things he says, terms that he uses, and every every letter has, and in fact, every book of the Bible, Old and New Testament, has terms of art that characterize that book, right? <clears throat> that, that are central, that are key to understanding the message of that particular book or letter. So if you look at the book of Philippians, for example, you know, joy, rejoicing is a central term. That second chapter with humility is a central thing, right? In the book of Galatians, the term works of the law, right? It's very big. You see that here in Romans as well. Here in Romans, the, the one of the big ones, there are several, one of the big ones is justification, right? Which here, I like that he translated it as putting things right or being in the right. So you see everywhere you saw in the right, just substitute the word justification, but he did that on purpose because people they don't have a clue what justification means. And that, that's one of those buzzwords that just kind of flies over our heads because <clears throat> we don't understand what, what, what in the world he means by that. Why? Because we're centuries literally removed from what that's all about. And when you understand who Paul was, a Pharisee, when you understand that Paul was in effect a lawyer, he was a, a religious lawyer, right? That's what Many of the Pharisees were. Their training was legal training in, in, in mostly in oral traditions. <clears throat> when you understand that he's a lawyer and he uses lawyer tactics, right, then it becomes more evident why some of the things that Paul says are difficult to understand. So all those things, right, not having the full context of what's going on. So you're kind of doing some guesswork, some detective work. Really, studying the Bible in our modern day is very much like being a detective. And you have to have the right kind of tools. You have to understand geography. You have to understand history. You have to understand language. Boy, do you have to understand language. And you have to understand culture, right? Language and culture are not the same thing. So when you look at all those things, it, that's why it's so hard to understand this book. You think that the people in Paul's day who were listening to this letter, you think that they, that they were sitting around scratching their head saying, what in the world is Paul saying? Probably not. They probably knew exactly what he was saying. Although, although there is some internal evidence that Paul was, you know, it's like today, if, if I start dazzling you with a bunch of million dollar words, you might scratch your head a little bit too. And apparently Paul had a tendency to do that because even Peter said in, in, in his, uh, his second letter, he said, there's something that Paul, our brother, beloved brother Paul wrote, which are hard to understand. Right. So, you know, he, he was kind of, he was a little bit out there for even his people in his day. So imagine us now removed literally, th you know, thousands of years later, 2000 years later, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is be encouraged because these things can be deciphered, but you have to, you have to really look into it. And anyone, by the way, who wants to give you stat pander, uh, uh, pat standard answers for any of these things, ah, it's so easy, it means this, it means this, it means that. you know what, I'm sorry, but dismiss those people, run, flee from them, because they're not being honest with you. Okay. I've been studying the Bible for over 30 years. And, you know, I think I know a thing or two. And let me tell you, it takes, it takes some work to understand that. N.T. Wright, who did this translation, he's been studying the book of Romans for over 30 years. And only now, in these days, is he in the full fruition of being able to explain things. Because it's not, it's not easy. So anyway, I don't want to go on and on about that. But I want you to understand why the book of Romans is so difficult to understand. It was written to a group of people. It was, it was a cosmopolitan group of people, you know, in, in Paul's day. 
Uh, Rome was founded, by the way, on seven hills, right? And when I say hills, I don't mean these teeny little things that we see here in Pennsylvania, right? I'm talking about, you know, massive hills. And the emperor lived on pretty much one, one of the, 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 on the, the length of one of those hills. And then the rich people would live in those hills. And then because one thing you need to understand about Rome is that the, the river Tiber that goes through it in the center, in the lower part of the city, it, it was prone to flooding. So that's why the wealthy used to live up higher and the emperor would live up higher. And then a lot of the common people would live in, in the lower portions there. So people were, you know, were, were crowded in pretty well. And you can imagine the early believers, it was all house worship, right? It were, there were homes in which they were worshiping. So what we're doing now in our day, that's what they did. That's what they did in their day. They didn't have the local assembly that they can go to. They didn't even have the synagogue because at that time, by, by this time that Paul is teaching, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really kind of, getting away from the synagogue worship because the differences are so great that they're not very much welcome in the synagogues anymore, right? So what they're doing is they're doing what we would call today home fellowships. And they're getting together in these lower parts of the city. And, uh, you know, and, and you just kind of, you can picture some of the things that are that, that are happening here. You know, we're in good company in terms of what we what we do. And they'll get together to do what we do, to pray, to, you know, to eat together, break bread, to study the word, and try to do the best they can. And we're talking about, most scholars believe that you're probably talking about less, but by, by this time, and Paul, this is really deep into Paul's career. We're talking about maybe maybe 100 people or less in Rome. It's not very many people. 100 people or less in a city of, in Paul's day, a city of 1 million. Not very large by our standards today, right? Something like New York is something like 4 million, all right? But in their day, that's huge, right? One million people. So they're trying to, they're trying to hold things together in a city of one million people, this small group of worshipers, and they're, you know, they're living in these lowlands and watching out for floods and watching out for, you know, all the things that would be happening. And then persecution, there had been, um, there had been, uh, and also the setting of this is after Jews had returned to Rome, because remember that the Jews have been expelled one time for Rome. So if you go over to uh, Acts 18, and I'm not going to go too deeply in all this, but I just want to give you some context here to envision it better, right? So in Acts 18 is when Paul goes to Corinth, and that's when he meets uh, Priscilla and Aquila, who were from Rome. So after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, maybe not Rome per se, but Italy, certainly, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. I guess this, I'd have to look at the geography. I guess Pontus is a part of Rome or, or, or in, the, in the vicinity, because he had to leave. So because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. <clears throat> so by this time, obviously, they're back. But the, Jew, the Romans were no lovers of the Jewish people. I'll tell you that right now. There was just too much animosity because of the differences in religion and Rome and, and their, their idolatry and the standards, the, the, you know, the eagles that would march to cities, etc. And plus taxation and all the things that made Rome particularly odious to the Jewish people. The Romans you know, were equally contempt. Uh, they had equal contempt for them in, in return, right? So well, when, um, when, when Claudius came into power, uh, none of these Roman emperors were particularly nice guys either, right? They were trying to hold on to power, and they did it at all costs. Claudius literally expelled them from the city. And then later, ironically enough, when Nero came into power, Nero was the emperor when Paul was was preaching. Uh, when Nero came back, he let Jews back into the city. Of course, at some point, you know, he blamed the believers for the fires in Rome and other things, and things really soured and went down south. But initially, Jews were allowed back. And here's the thing, right? Believers were struggling, you know, what people call Christians, believers were struggling because not only were they Jews, many of them, right? Not, there, was, there was a mix when, okay, so picture this. Before they're expelled from Rome, you have a very small group to begin with. Most of them are Jews, some Gentiles, but most of them are Jews. So already Rome doesn't like them because they're Jews. And then when they start keeping the faith, not even their own 
countrymen like them, right? Because now they're believers and they believe differently, and they, you know, they they believe in Yahshua as the Messiah, you know, and this this Jew who was crucified, right? Which is, you know, which is like you know unheard of that a Messiah would be someone crucified. Messiah is supposed to be like King David that comes in and you know and 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 wins the day, not someone who's killed like a common criminal. So you know, in in our day, we. We, we don't fully understand the impact of those things and how it would have looked to people in the ancient world. So they were hated by the Romans, they were distrusted by their fellow Jews, and then they're expelled from Rome. And then there are still Gentile believers there and presumably it may have flourished a bit and they got more people in, but mainly Gentiles because Jews can no longer be there. And then now Jews come back under Nero and now they're thrown back in the mix. Gentiles are probably not entirely clear on the Jewish nature of this faith, much like today, everyone looks at the scriptures through Gentile eyes. They don't look at they don't look at the scriptures through Jewish eyes. That's why they can't understand much of what's in there because they don't really they, they can't see it because they're not speaking the same language. Because they think that the scriptures isn't it's a Gentile book and it isn't. It's an Israelite book. So you have to use the symbols. Just today I was having a study with someone. I said you to understand this thing in the book of Revelation, you got to go back believe it or not, Genesis, right? Because that's where you're going to find the interpretation. That's where you find the key, so to speak. It's not some code that you have to break. It's just you got you to compare the scriptures and you got to go back to the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevim, Ketuvim, what we call the Hebrew Bible, right? You have to go back there to get the symbols to decipher. So if you see the term horn in the New Testament, well, a horn, is, you know, is, what, what does that mean? Well, you got to go back to the book of Daniel. You got to go back here or whatever to see the symbol. Okay. But anyway, so now you have Gentiles in the city in Rome who are not fully understanding the teachings. The, the Jews come back. There, there's already conflict, right? Because now the Jews who have not been there for a while, you know, we like to ideally say, hey, brother, right? Gentile, Jew, everyone love, love, right? No, 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 no. That's not how human nature works. We know that, right? So now these Jews come back again, and now they're, you know, they're seeing the changes in this assembly, people gentilizing the faith because they don't understand the ties to the Jewish roots. So I'm giving, why am I saying all this? Because it gives you clues as to what Paul was trying to accomplish in the book of Romans. This is why he's so heavily talking in chapters 9, 10, 11 about the relationship between Gentiles and Jews, right? This is why he's talking so heavily about justification, because ultimately, as uh, no, I, I've never seen a better explanation than N.T. Wright gives. I have a whole book, whole book on it, that I still have to finish going through and get the full impact of it, because it's mind-boggling to me, because I've never seen it explained like this. It's a book on, on just, just on justification. This is one of many books that he wrote dealing with the book of Romans. Because what it boils down to is the covenant. It's he And he uses the term covenant justice or covenant faith. You see that in his translation over and over. So this term justification, everyone's seeing is justified, 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 but nobody knows what it means. Well, it means something. It means it has to do with the covenant, with the Tanakh. So a Gentile framework of the faith would never understand that. And apparently in Rome, they didn't understand that. So he's trying to explain the connection, the connection to the Jewish roots, the connection to justification. The connect it's, not, it's not this thing about we're going to do away with the law and get rid of it. And, you know, and now we have a completely new thing that's going on. No, but it has to do with the way in which justification, which, which means being put right. Yahweh setting things right, not only as a nation, but as individuals overcoming sin and being set right, being legally in the eyes of Yahweh, in the eyes of the Torah, being set right. And there's so much that goes with that, that I don't even have time to even begin that discussion today. But my point is that that back, that, that explanation is there. It's just that we have to mine it, right? Because that's the context in which we're looking at these things. Okay. And there's so much we could talk about. For example, chapter 14, he's talking about the, the food, right? There it is. We don't have to keep the food laws anymore because he said, don't eat, you know, you don't have to eat and blah, blah, you don't have to worry about food. And this. no, no, there's a context to that. What is the context? It's the same context as you see in first Corinthians when he's talking about meat that's sacrificed to idols. That has nothing to do with eating pork as compared to eating beef. Not, not a shred to do with that. It has to do with meats that were sacrificed to idols where people would see that and they say, oh, if you're eating meat that's sacrificed to idols, then you're partaking of idolatry. 
And Paul said, no, just like he said in 1 Corinthians, no, you're, you, the idol is nothing. All you're doing is eating a piece of meat that's been blessed in the name of an idol. And because there is no idol, it means nothing. Let them bless all they want. Go ahead and eat and enjoy it. But because there were some brethren that were being offended by that and they couldn't get it to their heads and they said to themselves, no, 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 no. If you're eating that thing, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. Then Paul said, if that's the case, this is when you have to subdue your pride, right? And when you have to say to yourself, boy, you know, that person's being ignorant. No, that's, that's where they are in their level of understanding. So out of love and out of grace and out of compassion, you have to say, you know what? I don't have a problem with my conscience but they have a problem with this. So therefore I'm not going to do it. Right. This is, this is why I'm very careful. Like there are certain things that I've taken it very slowly. Right. For example, we just did a study on the, the whole study that we did during the feast about the cross. I'm very careful about how I introduce that. You know, you know how long I've been using the term cross and crucifixion in my own personal thing, long time. But the reason that you're hearing about it more now is because I've been introducing it little by little because not everyone is ready for that. There are some people that they have been hearing all, you know, for like the last 20 years, that if you do this, if you believe this, and you believe that, then you're being a pagan and blah, blah, blah. And do I believe that? No, I do not. But do I understand why people feel that way? Absolutely, I do. And I can point to a half a dozen other doctrines that meet the same thing. My point is that we have to wait for one another. We have to subdue our own desires sometimes for the greater good, right? And this is what Paul's saying in chapter 14. And there are many other things that we can go to within the book of Romans that, that, that are fascinating to me. One of the biggest things in there that he starts the book off with, and I'll, I'll leave with this, is the whole concept of the gospel, right? Pre presenting himself as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a spokesperson for the gospel. That is the reason for his existence from his perspective, right? To, to spread the gospel to all people, Jew and Gentile. That's, that's the whole concept of explaining to people that there's a new king, Yahshua's king. But it's so much deeper than that. It's term, terminology that he uses in chapter one, right? Where he uses, he says, um, let's just go to chapter one for just a minute. Just in the first few verses. Paul, a servant of Messiah Yahshua, called to be an apostle, which is, in effect, an ambassador, right? And set apart for the gospel of Elohim. That's what he was sanctified for. To, that was his job, to, to, to spread the gospel. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, where? In places like Isaiah, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 52, and others. Regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was, a, who was appointed the son of Yahweh in power, the son of Elohim in power by his resurrection from the dead. Well, we see son of Elohim, and we just take it for granted today. Yeah, that's Yahshua, son of Elohim, etc. Uh, in their day, those would have been fighting words to the Romans. Why? Because who was son of, son of God? It was Caesar. Caesar was deliberately called son of God. This was not just, uh, you know, nice, this is, here's this nice religion that we have. And, you know, you, we, we know he's son of Elohim and all that. You know, it's, it's loaded terminology. It's not that Paul was going out to be deliberately provocative, right? Paul was a wise man. He knew how to take it easy. When you, when you look at Acts 17 and how he dealt with the Athenians, you can see his shrewdness, right? But he wasn't going to hold back either. He, he was going to make it known. Uh, we don't owe our allegiance ultimately to this man. We owe our allegiance to the true son of Elohim, who is Yahshua, the Messiah. And everywhere he talks, he's, he's speaking about his kingship, right? And, he, and he's explaining, you know, the, the whole idea who was uh, the, through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of Elohim in power by real, that's real power. What, what's real power? The resurrection, to bring someone from the dead, right? In other words, Rome, everything that they claim is power, pales in comparison to being to being able to raise people from the dead, which was anathema to many people, right? Raised from the dead. By his resurrection from the dead, what's he saying? You know that death is the ultimate power in the, in the eyes of mankind, right? If, if you can take someone's life, they think that they have the power over you. You know, yeah, it's very poetic to say, yeah, but you'll never, you know, you can never touch my spirit or whatever, right? But that's what people think. They think that if they can crush you, if they can take your life, then that's the ultimate victory. And the Romans certainly believe that. So uh, 
so the, so for for the Roman Empire, death was probably the ultimate weapon. This is why they did the crucifixions, right? They were gonna they were gonna kill you in a way that you that people would never forget, right? So they had this that slave revolt, and then they crucified thousands of people from the length of what would be equivalent to Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. That's a long distance with crosses all along the way so that the enemies can see, hey, if you go against Rome, this is what's going to happen to you because we have the ultimate power over you. And Paul comes back and basically and he says, you know what? The one who has, we've, we've just annulled, not we, Yahshua has just annulled your final weapon. It's like someone coming and saying, you know, the nuclear weapon is gonna is gonna you know th this is the ultimate weapon and all of a sudden someone invents something that you know someone goes ahead and and I don't even know scientifically I'm sure I'm speaking you know like what I don't know but someone drops the nuclear weapon and then someone you know sends out a wormhole or something to swallow it up right okay let me just say what I just said he's saying there's a new king and we're gonna end here anyway here there's a new king to whom we owe our allegiance and death doesn't have power anymore right this is what he sums up pretty much in in chapter at the end of chapter seven, right? It says none of these things. What, what what's going to keep us from the love of Messiah? Angels, devils, right? I mean, I'm adding stuff here, but he basically says I'm not going to turn to it just to save time. But there's nothing persecution, not because they don't have that kind of power over us. Anyway, and on and on we could go. But uh, I hope it's, I hope you are willing sometime in the future to do a more more th thorough study of the Book of Romans. But uh, number one, I have to go and study and really understand it well myself. And, uh, and also, I, I'm going to need a lot of time for that. So that's, uh, that's where I'll leave it for today. So thank you so much for patiently hearing me out. And uh, may Yahweh bless you.